I welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for taking uh, this time out of this evening uh, here in Las Vegas where there's many, many other things to do to uh, listen to me talk a little bit about data modeling and NoSQL. Who knew that topic would be so popular, huh? Um, my name is Rick Houlihan. I am a uh, principal technologist for NoSQL for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I've uh, done a lot of NoSQL data modeling over the years. I've worked on the specialist team. I helped build the North American practice there. Um, I've worked on the Black Belt team internally to help migrate over 12,000 uh, Amazon services or some, some odd number uh, around there uh, over several years as well to, uh, from Oracle to uh, NoSQL. How many people have heard of that migration? We've shut down 3,000 Oracle instances. All right, a few of you folks out there. Uh, and uh, in the course of doing all this, we learned a lot of things. And that's uh, what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about tonight. Uh, and some of these things might be surprising to some folks and maybe less so to others. Uh, a lot of the stuff we talked a little bit about last year, we're going to get more uh, into uh, some of the complex modeling that we can actually do uh, with, with NoSQL that people might not be so aware of. So the first thing I like to talk about in all of these sessions is a brief history of data processing. Why are we looking at NoSQL? And I know a lot of you have already heard this, but some of you haven't. And the real reason, that, and the reason I do this is because if you want a message to be understood, you have to repeat it. It has to be broadcast. So for those of you who've heard it, I ask you for a minute or two, for those of you who haven't, hopefully you'll get something out of that conversation. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of an overview of DynamoDB, more from a you know, structural perspective, what is NoSQL? I'm not going to talk a lot about APIs, features, and functions. That's not what we're here for. We're really here to talk about uh, NoSQL data modeling. Uh, that's what this session is really about. How do I actually model data? How do I do things in the real world <coughs> with real apps? Uh, in a way that actually makes sense uh, and works for my application and works for me from an economic uh, e uh, efficiency perspective. And so that's what we'll talk a lot about is data modeling. Uh, most of the examples I use might be synthetic, but they're going to use real access patterns, patterns that we use in real application services, and I'll actually call those out uh, as we talk through those. Uh, we're going to get into some of the common patterns, and we'll talk about some of the real-world applications that we built, but uh, really, again, those access patterns that we use. Uh, so again, the first thing we talk about a little bit is the history. Why are we looking at what we're, uh, this new technology? Because we've had this relational technology that's worked so well for so long. And, and to understand this, we really need to understand that if the history of data processing was laid out for us to look at, it would be a series of peaks and valleys in data pressure, right? And data pressure is what we define as what we're asking the system to do and how fast and how cheap it's happening. If it's not happening fast enough or cheap enough, cheap enough then we've got a high, high data pressure situation and we're going to do a lot of different things. It's a technology trigger. We're going to invent a lot of new things uh, to fix that. And we have over the years. The first one that we had, again, was the one between our ears. Uh, it's a great database, <coughs> highly available. When my eyes are open, it's online, uh, but not necessarily you know, uh, highly durable. Fault tolerance is questionable. Single user system, the whole nine yards, not exactly something I'm going to build an enterprise uh, database on top of. So we actually had to start learning how to do different things, and we learned how to write things down, right? We created a system of ledger accounting. It was the first method of storing structured data. Uh, it ran public and private se sector workloads for millennia until the 1880 US Census came along, and a man named Herman Hollerith was tasked with <coughs> processing all the data that was collected. It took him eight years of the 10-year cycle using a ledger accounting method to do so, and he realized he had to do something new, and he did. He invented the machine-readable punch card and the punch card sorting machine, so in 1890, it took him a lot less time. Now, this actually was an interesting turning point in the evolution of data processing. We started inventing many technologies, paper tape, magnetic tape, distributed block storage, random access file systems. And when we got to the 1980s, it's very important to understand why we invented the relational database was to decrease the pressure on the storage subsystems in the data center. Right, this is really the reason we invented the relational database, because it uses a normalized data model, and that normalized data model deduplicates the data on disk. It makes things nice and efficient when your storage is expensive. We don't really care about CPU in 1980, not so much. Fast forward 30, 40 years, and the opposite is now true. Right? When I, <laughs> I you know, deploy applications data center today, the storage is pennies per gigabyte. The, 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 the CPU is dollars per CPU minute. I don't want to use technologies that are optimized for yesteryears. Uh, you know, uh, uh, situations, right? They want to optimize for today's situations. And this is why we use, uh, uh, are going to NoSQL database. So now it's, under, it's important to understand when you use new technologies that we need to understand how to use them before we deploy them or we will not have good experiences. We found this out very quickly at Amazon as we started to migrate many of our workloads and saw what we thought was great success. <clears throat> then we started moving bigger workloads and found out that, you know what, it's really easy to do small things badly and think that you're doing okay, right? <laughs> 
Uh, as you move those bigger workloads, you start to find out that, wow, this thing's not working very well. We're not having the experiences we expected. It's not cheaper. It's not faster. <clears throat> Why is this happening? And you start to analyze the system, and really what you figure out is you didn't know how to use the new technologies. You tried to use them the same way you use the old technologies. In the case of NoSQL, that's about data models. If you use a normalized data model, you are going to have pain at scale <coughs> when, you, when, you, when you expand and you scale out your operations. So this technology, this chart really kind of, I like this because it talks about the adoption curve. In the beginning, we have a technology trigger. People are running around trying to solve problems. In our case, it's data pressure. We invent this new technology. People go to use it. Some people have success. Others run to the new technology, and they have a miserable experience because they haven't figured out how to use it. Now, as the technology skills evolve in the market and distribute across the market, we have better experiences because people understand how to use the technology. Today, we understand how to use relational technology. Tomorrow, we will all understand how to use NoSQL technology. And modeling data in NoSQL is not going to be any harder tomorrow than it is today to model your relational data. I get this all the time. It's so hard. It's so hard to use these models. No, it's not. It's actually just learn a different way of thinking about your data. And hopefully, this conversation today is going to help you get there. When we talk about NoSQL, it's important to understand it's not good for everything. right? It's good for a certain class of applications, and that class of applications are those that have repeatable access patterns. And the reason why is because I need to denormalize my data model if I'm going to be able to simplify my access patterns. We'll get into this when we talk about the modeling. But that denormalized model is very tightly coupled to the access pattern. In the case of a relational database, the ad hoc query engine gives me some flexibility. If I don't understand how I'm going to be accessing the data, then it can be very beneficial for me to have an ad hoc query engine. And that's really suitable for an OLAP type of workload. Online analytics, this is a really <clears throat> not a good workload for NoSQL. So understand the difference here. Good for us in NoSQL land that 90% of the applications we write are, are, are written to support common business processes which represent OLTP applications. So it's actually one of the most relevant technologies you can learn uh, as a developer today going forward. <clears throat> All right, DynamoDB, again, we're not going to get too much into you know, uh, the, the, the top level of what is Dynamo. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a fully managed NoSQL database. And this is the biggest value add you get from Dynamo. It's cloud native. You don't have to spend resources managing nodes, rebuilding storage devices, you know, replicating in new shards, <clears throat> figuring out how long is it going to take me to get this shard online. And believe me, that can take a long time. Uh, we have customers, the largest customers in the world, uh, using legacy NoSQL technologies now working with us because you know, it takes them months, literally, to add new shards into a MongoDB cluster. When you get up to 15, 20 shards and you need more, it starts taking weeks, months, to get the new capacity online. And this is a common problem that people have run into at scale. Not only that, the amount of resources that you're going to dedicate uh, to managing your NoSQL cluster can be much better spent actually building your business. <laughs> so NoSQL databases, we'll get into the performance aspects of this, have a lot of advantages over your legacy NoSQL technologies that you're just never going to be able to realize by rolling your own. Uh, if you want to talk about scale, it's fast and consistent at any scale, <laughs> scales to support any workload. We have examples of single tables in excess of 7 million transactions per second. I, I, don't, I challenge you to bring me another NoSQL database that scaled out to that level. 54.5 million transactions per second was what the Amazon CDO tables did on Prime Day 2019. I heard we shattered that record over Cyber Monday, Black Friday. I don't know what those numbers are, but they're massive. You know, this is just not something you see from the legacy NoSQL providers. <laughs> All right, when you get into modeling data in NoSQL, it's important to understand a couple of constructs. The first thing is a table. Table is an object repository. It's where I'm going to push items. Items can exist on the table. They must have a, uh, a single attribute called the partition key. As far as that, any other attribute <coughs> is not required. In this particular configuration, what I have is a collection of objects that are identified uniquely by those partition keys and supports a key value access pattern. If I query this table with the partition key equals x, I'm going to get a single object back. If I define, and this is actually, you know, this is kind of similar to a document database, right? In document DB, I'm going to define a collection. In the collection, I'm going to push documents. Those documents are going to have under bar ID as a unique attribute. And I'm going to query the system on a key value access pattern, give me the document with an under bar ID value of x, right? I will talk a little bit about the difference between document models <coughs> and uh, uh, wide column models. 
Uh, but one of the biggest difference between the document and the wide column model is the ability to add a sort key to the table. Right? So on, the part, on this collection now of objects, what I've done is I've defined a partition key that defines a collection or a group of objects. And inside of that partition now, the sort key uniquely identifies the objects in that partition. Okay, and I can use range queries to query those objects selectively out of that partition. So example here might be a partition key is a customer ID, a sort key is an order date, and I'm gonna query for customers' orders by date, let's say everything in the last 30 days, right? A date range condition of greater than 30 days, partition key condition equals customer X, brings back that list of orders for that particular customer, right? And I could have 1,000 orders in that partition, but those are the orders that are gonna come back. Conversely, I can also create other constructs we'll talk about that can I, I put other uh, types of items. They don't have to be homogenous collections of items. They can be heterogeneous collections of items. But what we really have done is we've created now this object repository where our primary table creates, uh, holds a, a, a aggregation of objects that satisfies a certain collection of access patterns. So, uh, in essence, what we've done is joined objects into a partition, and we're going to start to decorate these objects with additional attributes that we're going to index to create additional aggregations or grouping of objects. And so if you think about what I'm describing here, I'm really describing the ability to join objects. So this is what, I, this is what we do in NoSQL. It's not that we can't join objects. We, we create model joins, right? We model our data so that we can group these objects into partitions on the table, partitions on the GSIs, and we're going to decorate these objects <coughs> with common attributes that are going to tie them together when I query on various access patterns. We're going to show you how to do this. Uh, but this is not so different than the way actually relational databases work when they actually have to join data that's not indexed, right? They create a hash table, and then they do lookups against the hash table as they iterate through the inbound collection or the, or the outer collection. Uh, so what we're really doing is storing data in that, in that uh, uh, distributed hash table structure. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about being able to insert multiple items into the table. This is how we're going to do that. This is an example of a table where, again, we have a partition key, which is a customer ID. Uh, we have a sort key, which is indexed by time. Uh, we're, and it's actually got several items in there. Some items have a time uh, a prefix, others don't. Uh, and if I query this particular partition with a query that says, give me everything that's greater than 30 days ago, I'm going to get all the orders, all the order items, as well as the customer's metadata, because that's going to satisfy that query condition as well. So I don't actually have to query multiple tables. This is the crux of NoSQL design. What I'm trying to do is create collections of multiple objects or multiple types of objects that I can query with single queries. I don't have to go traversing multiple tables to get that. I don't have to issue a query against the customer's table to get the customer's metadata and a query against the order's table to get the order's metadata, then iterate through the order's result set and then go get all the items for those orders from another table. This is an amazingly complex workflow that I'm avoiding by, by grouping these items into a partition like this, right? So this is the kind of games we're going to play to be able to satisfy uh, those queries, right? So now when I uh, <coughs> go get those result sets, oops, sorry, uh, I have a much simpler access pattern, right? So uh, again, with indexes, this is what we're going to do to support a secondary access patterns, right? With a, with a, uh, and a, you can think of an index in DynamoDB as a, a, a table that is uh, replicated uh, as you insert and change data on the parent table, right? We take care of that replication. There's a 100% SLA guarantee on GSI replication. These GSIs are eventually consistent but they're 10 millisecond latency, P99, when properly configured. So it's a very, very good uh, system to be able to uh, support secondary access patterns. In off-the-shelf NoSQL databases, you can't necessarily do this with some of these guys, right? Like Cassandra, they even tell you, don't, don't use indexes because there's no way to maintain consistency on their indexes. DynamoDB indexes are guaranteed to be consistent. So this is one of the biggest value adds of DynamoDB others, uh, over some of the other NoSQL providers out there. One of the other things we do with DynamoDB indexes is we support projections. So if you need to uh, have an access pattern, let's say, that needs to identify the items that match on the table, and when I identify those items, I also need some of the other attributes those items contain, I can choose to project all, some, or none of those attributes onto the GSI. Now remember, when you do this, <coughs> uh, you're increasing the storage cost. Essentially, I could be duplicating the data. If I project all the attributes, I've duplicated or doubled the storage cost and doubled the uh, WCU cost of the insert, of any inserts I make to the table. So uh, you know, this is a good way to, under, you know, when you get into understanding your access patterns, you, you want to start to control costs by controlling what you project to the indexes. If I only need to know the items that match, then only project the keys. 
If I only need, if I need to know additional data, then project what you need, but don't project more. Okay, so partition keys in NoSQL are used to uh, spread the data out, so to speak. In DynamoDB, we create an unordered hash index. We spread those items out across this arbitrary key space, and we chop this key space up as we need to add additional capacity, either storage or throughput. This is important because an individual storage node on the array only has so much throughput. So when we design for DynamoDB or for any NoSQL database, we need to take into account the idea that we need to get the workload spread out if we want to scale, in, uh, scale the system in throughput. Uh, and the, the way we're going to do this uh, in DynamoDB is to use a technique we call write sharding for uh, highly dense aggregation. So the example here, using our customer's partition key uh, and, and the data that we have laid out might be that I want a secondary index that's going to tell me, give me all of the orders that were made uh, from a given source, right? So if you think about Amazon retail, when they want to get all the uh, uh, orders from the odd that were sourced online, that could be a very dense aggregation. In DynamoDB, you only get about 1,000 WCUs per second. So if the, on the GSI, I'm trying to aggregate by source, and all I'm doing is using a, a, a source as a partition key, then the only way to increase throughput is to create additional partition keys by salting those partition keys that I'm indexing. So in this case, I'm aggregating the uh, orders by source, I'm aggregating the items by uh, product ASIN, uh, and I'm looking for additional data, right? The state of these products <coughs> uh, in shipment, I'm looking for the source of the orders and support additional access patterns. Now when I do this on the read side, what I'm gonna do behind some sort of data layer API is create a parallel processing system that allows me to query across those partitions, assemble the data for my clients, and produce a nice collection uh, if users have to query across those partitions to gather all of that data, right? But I'm not going to require all my developers to go out there and understand how things are right sharded. I'm going to do this at the data layer, and the reason why is because oftentimes when I'm designing for DynamoDB, I need to uh, right shard some of my customers maybe, but not all of them. Right? And if you look at Amazon tables, AWS tables, configuration tables, sometimes you need to come to us and ask us to increase the number of configuration items or, or IAM policies or, or whatever it is you're using. And some of those reasons why are because maybe because we need to do some DynamoDB write sharding if you go beyond X. You're going to exceed 1,000 WCUs on one of our indexes or maybe even on the primary table based on our estimated write traffic uh, if you go beyond a given point. So uh, <clears throat> you're going to want to conceal all of this from your users by creating some sort of data layer API that's going to handle the right sharding behind a request to go get the data. Users provide some conditions, the API uh, then shards the data or, or uh, <coughs> uh, retrieves the data from multiple shards. Now, just like the table, we want to use generic keys because when we use generic keys, we can, we can, we can insert multiple items into, common, in, into the GSIs. Right? Like on the table, we have multiple types of partitions the way, and multiple types of items. And the way we make this happen is we use these generic keys called PK and SK. Well, I showed you the two patterns we want to index, right? By orders by source, items by uh, a state. I want to be able to uh, maybe reuse my GSI for both of those access patterns because if I create two GSIs, I got to allocate two capacity buckets, I got to set up two you know, sets of alerts and alarms, and I can't reuse the capacity that's allocated to one when these access patterns are, are, are probably not, not happening in parallel. So it's more efficiency to reuse the GSIs. I reuse a lot of GSIs to reduce the number of constructs we have to maintain in production. Now, when I query the GSI, it's the sort key and the, or the partition and sort key conditions that define what it is that returns. I don't have to uh, I worry about those objects colliding, so to speak. You know, if they have the same potential for collision on the partition key, I can prefix the partition key with the item type to avoid that. But the, you know, in this particular use case, I don't because there's no chance for collision between an ASIN and a source for an order. When I query with a source as the partition key, I'm going to get those order items. When I query with an ASIN as the partition key, I'm going to get the order items that are actually uh, parts of those orders, right? So depending on the use case, depending on the access pattern, the keys are good to find the items that come back. All right, so when it gets into scaling NoSQL, again, it's about getting that data spread out. When you don't spread the data out, this is, this is what happens. We get these, what we call hot keys. This is a heat map. Uh, we now have a, uh, <coughs> a CloudWatch feature that allows people to look at uh, the, the uh, these keys, we don't, you don't get heat map views like this, but you can look at the keys that are being uh, experiencing pressure like this. In this case, we have a number of servers on the uh, y-axis. We have time 
on the x-axis. Uh, and you can see you know, server number 11 there is doing a whole bunch of work uh, and everybody else is doing nothing. We want to avoid patterns like this. This is an anti-pattern. It's a high velocity access pattern that's firing on a small number of keys or a single key. So the way to get the most out of DynamoDB out of any NoSQL database, uh, as a matter of fact, is to spread the workloads out. Right, is we want to scale the system, we want to get more and more shards, more and more storage nodes you know, participating in the work. Uh, and so we're going to spread that data out across the key space, and we're going to hopefully have our requests kind of line up well over time. Uh, sometimes that's not the way things work, right? We get thundering herds. We had Cyber Monday and Black Friday just recently, so we know a little bit about that. If you do it right, uh, this is what ends up happening. You get uh, pictures like this. This is a great... Uh, Heat map, this is uh, about 450 servers. Uh, they're pumping about 40 to 50,000 uh, WCUs consistently over time across their key space. And you can see how that access pattern is just lighting up like a Christmas tree. Up and down the key space, this looks like the white noise on the TV uh, when you change between channels, right? That's the, I don't know if any of that doesn't even happen anymore, does it? <laughs> okay, I'm an old man, I can't help it. All right, so these are the things that happen when you uh, <coughs> go to cloud native and no SQL services. Uh, you get uh, the ability to kind of just in time provision your tables. It's in, in, in both dimensions, storage and capacity and throughput. Uh, in this case, what we're looking at on the left hand side there is your relational database. That's your legacy no SQL technologies, right? This is MongoDB, this is Cassandra. You are provisioning for peak. You, you are hoping you are consuming a high percentage of that capacity that you have provisioned, but the reality is the average data center utilization in the enterprise is 10%. If you're doing better than that over time, then you're doing really good. So the reality is you're wasting a lot of money. On the right-hand side, this is DynamoDB. This is cloud-native database technology with auto-scaling. This is a real service. It runs in one of our fulfillment centers, and you can see the difference between they turned on auto-scaling uh, and before. It's night and day. The amount of cost that they're saving is around 40%. I think most of our fulfillment center applications are saving around 40%. And it works very well when you have that kind of nicely shaped uh, demand curve for applications. We have other pricing models if you don't. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about those. I'm not really going to talk too much about pricing models. But I like to talk about performance and performance at scale because nothing else performs like DynamoDB uh, or other cloud native NoSQL databases. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at uh, in DynamoDB, I don't know what other database you're going to look at and say it gets faster when you throw more load at it, right? I mean, that's like counterintuitive, right? With most databases, this is a synthetic workload ramping up over a million requests per second, and what you can see is the low latency, uh, consistent low latency at, at the peak utilization, and the reason why is because we have this massively distributed request router fleet, and that request router fleet needs to know about your table to service your request, so if it doesn't know about your table, it has to hit a configuration service to understand your policies, your, uh, your, your storage node locations, and all the various information it needs to know to actually process the request. Over time, as that information caches in the request router, we don't have to go back and look at that data. So it's actually going to get faster, and that's what happens over and over again. And we have many customers uh, that have come to us and said, is this real? And, you know, their APM instrumentation may be telling them uh, things that they don't believe, and we can say, yes, it's a common phenomena. Uh, the other thing we see with DynamoDB that's really amazing is the ability to deliver more than you have provisioned. We have this thing called a burst bucket. This is an example of a message service provider that around the Super Bowl, they were provisioned close to 6 million <coughs> WCUs. Uh, at the Super Bowl, when it ended, they peaked at over 10 million uh, WCUs. Uh, they didn't notice this until the next day. They came back after looking at their CloudWatch metrics and, oh my gosh, what happened here? How come we didn't throttle? And the reason why is because you have a five minute burst bucket with DynamoDB, you can go to this database and you can say, hey, look, uh, I know you weren't busy five minutes ago. Can you give me that now, please? I mean, what happens with, with MongoDB when you do this? What happens with Cassandra? What happens with your relational database when you do this, right? It goes offline, okay? <laughs> That's what happens, it goes bye-bye. And so, and you're gonna start to see your requests and response times go through the roof as you put the memory pressure on those systems, right? Not so with DynamoDB, it's built to be elastic, to buffer that throughput and give it to you when you need it. Okay, so let's talk about data modeling. That's really what we're here for. <clears throat> uh, 
And we talked about some of the basic data modeling, but it's really about relationships when we talk about data modeling, okay? And relationships uh, I drive every application I've ever worked on. I, I've never been able to build an application without understanding the relational model, the entity relationship model, and that doesn't change when you get into NoSQL, right? It, you know, what, what changed was us thinking that we can create these big giant blobs of data that hold these relational structures, right? The idea that, hey, these giant JSON documents are good ideas. You know what, ba big documents are bad ideas. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the modeling. But it, it doesn't matter what type of application you're building, social networking, document management, IT systems management, anything you're working on requires us to build relationships, even if it's a key value access pattern. That's a, that's a relationship. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the key and the values that are associated to it. And, and you know, if there's not, I want to know. Please tell me, is there any non-relational data that you're aware of? I, I haven't found it. As a matter of fact, I would love to have a non-relational banking application because I would log in over and over again until I saw the numbers that I liked, right? And then I would write my checks. And I'd go, okay. <laughs> Hopefully it's Jeff Bezos' account. I'll be really happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe not. I, I probably wouldn't be here very long if I did that. But that <laughs> that's okay. All right, so this is what we've done when we model relational data. We use a normalized data model. This is an example I've been using for years. It's a simple product catalog. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between products and books, albums and videos, one-to-many between albums and tracks, many-to-many -many between videos and actors, and, and the various queries we have to run are, are quite complex. We're going to dive into that in a second. Uh, but what we might do with a relational database uh, in this way where we would use ad hoc queries to join these tables and a lot of CPU power to assemble the views we're looking for, we're actually going to go ahead with NoSQL, and this might be a simple approach of doing this, would be to kind of create that, those, those views, so to speak, or those hierarchies of data that we're commonly querying by assembling them into documents. You can think of all the rows of these relational tables and sticking them into these documents, or partitions, as we will demonstrate in a second, uh, which can be very interesting in how we're going to access them. But let's take a look at the complexity of those queries, right? So let's populate some data in these tables. Let's take a look at the various queries we're running. So the first query we're gonna run is a single one-to-one -one relationship, not terrible, the time complexity. You know, that particular query is a login, an n login, or uh, m login. Can't really see n log m, whatever. Don't have my glasses on. Uh, <laughs> when we, uh, when you start to add more tables, that time complexity just gets worse, right? There's no, uh, there's no adjusting this, there's no fixing this, and this is assuming that we have all the proper indexes and that we're, we're running you know, nested loop joins and we're not having to do terrible things like you know, merge joins and hash joins, but, but, but we're actually doing things efficiently. That time complexity just goes up, it goes up, it goes up. The more, the more tables I join in, it goes up. When we start to look at NoSQL, right? NoSQL is basically built on distributed hash table, so NoSQL queries theoretically have uh, you know, time constant, right? So this is taking all those same joins, right? And creating uh, partitions that more or less pre-join the data. Now, if you think about the worst case scenario of a relational database, what is it doing? It's probably going to hash join, right? I've got a large input set, I've got a large table. Let me go ahead and table scan, create a hash index on the sort dimension that I need, right? Let's go ahead and then start to iterate my input collection. I'm gonna query the hash table repeatedly to draw out the, the items that match, right? Well, this is, why not do that first? Because obviously the database believes that a hash table is the actual, you know, uh, the most efficient data, data structure to query when I need to do repeated queries. So let's go ahead and do that. And that's really what we're doing here. We're creating partitions. These partitions have the rows or the items from our relational structures. And as we query through this, in the particular case here, I'm querying for a book. Uh, it's a time constant. If I query for uh, the album, I query by the, the album title. It's, again, time constant, no sort condition. So I'm just going to the database and give me everything with this partition key. Uh, give me everything with the movie partition key. Now, the interesting thing about querying the movie here is that what I've done is I have both movie and actor partitions, and the movies are related to the actor partitions through those items that are sorted on the actor's name. So this is a graph. This is a directed graph. I have movie partitions. Those are movie nodes. I have actor nodes. I have all these items inside of that movie node that, or that are in that movie partition that describe the relationships between the movie and the various actors. Uh, the, the movie partition understands what it's related to in this particular data structure that the, the actor doesn't yet. We'll get into that. <laughs> but when I query this partition for the movie, I'm going to get a set of items. The, one, the first one describes the, uh, the movie. It describes the movie, and it's sorted on the director's name. If I query, uh, if I get a list of actors, I can 
put together a summary view here that shows me the movie and the actors that are in the movie, uh, what their names are, what their ages are, what their genders are, what role they played. And I'll project the dates of their birth dates and their uh, genders, because that's relatively immutable data. It doesn't change. And uh, <clears throat> I wish I could change my birthday, but that's not happening. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, in, in any case, it's OK to project immutable data onto these edges to make the read more efficient. I'm optimizing for the read. But I won't project the bio, because the bio changes. I don't want to have to update the bio across all the actors' roles and whatnot. But so I'm, I'm using those edges to describe, to tell me some things about these actors. If I go to, this, to create an index, and I flip the partition and the sort key around, right? so I take the sort key, and it becomes the partition key of the GSI. And, partition key becomes the sort key, now I can actually query on additional uh, uh, dimensions, right? I can query for all the books that an author wrote. I can query for uh, all of the albums that a song shows up on. I could query for all of the movies that an actor's been in. Well, now what have I done? I've completed that many to many. This is now an undirected graph. Both sides understand what they're related to. I'll query the table for one side. I'll query the GSI for the other. Right, this is how we model many-to-many -many relationships in NoSQL and avoid massive duplication of data. Right? The only data where I'm duplicating is denormalized across those edges, and I can decide what I'm going to project onto those edges. Oftentimes, those edges need the extended metadata that describes what is the relationship, what is the role, what are the permissions, what are the things about this association to this object that this person has or that this other object has in my system. Uh, I can query for the movies that a director has directed. I could query for uh, the albums that a musician has produced, uh, so on and so forth, right? This is how we're going to model additional access patterns. One set of access patterns on the table, another set of access patterns on our indexes, uh, and that's the primary way that we'll do it. Okay, let's get into uh, documents versus wide column. And this is really important because there's a lot of hype out there. There's a lot of people talking about how it's all different. And there's use cases for document. There's use cases for wide column. And, and I'll tell you, when you get into actually modeling the data, no, it's not. There's not a lot of differences. As, as a matter of fact, there's none. We're going to get into that. Let's talk about this document model. We have a, an employee item. Uh, this, this employee item might be indexed on a couple of dimensions. In a document database, under bar ID is a default index. Uh, and we're going to be able to query on that key value access pattern. We're going to use a meaningful value for under bar ID. I know in MongoDB, if you insert an object without under bar ID, it gives you a UUID. Uh, what that really does is creates a dead index for most practical purposes. Most applications, I don't care about an object referenced by UUID. Maybe some do, but uh, no one calls up customer support and says, I'm customer UUID, right? They call up customer support and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. What's your email address is the first question. So use something that's meaningful as a key, as a, a primary key. And then we're going to create a secondary index, a compound index on the building.floor to support subtree aggregations of our employees. In this particular example, that's what we're trying to produce. All right, so query where you know, the building ID equals X, and uh, the floor starts with you know, floor seven, give me everybody on the seventh floor of this given building, or so forth, so on and so forth. So let's take that data model, and we're going to move that data model into a wide column data structure, and we're going to see how different this is. And really, it's just a different way to display the data. As a matter of fact, when I query the data in DynamoDB, what comes back? I don't know how many folks have queried DynamoDB, but what I see is JSON, right? It's just a data structure, OK? Data structures can be flat like this. They can be hierarchical. In DynamoDB, we support JSON attributes, so you can have hierarchies of data. As a matter of fact, the fastest way to query your DynamoDB table is to put your unindexed attributes in JSON. All right, so if you have lots of attributes in your documents, <coughs> create a big JSON document and insert that in as one attribute, and then project above into the root of the item all of your, your indexable attributes because we can't index the attributes inside of a JSON object. But DynamoDB will treat that JSON object like a big blob, a single attribute. Okay, and We actually have to store each attribute in the storage engine. So if you create a JSON attribute, it's one attribute. If you split that all out into a lot of attributes, it actually takes a little bit more time. And there's a blog post out there for it you can look at. All right, getting into the differences then, what we're really talking about is indexing. <coughs> and how do we query? Right, the system. And that's, it's really the difference in that kind of uh, dimension. It has nothing to do with the data model. In document DB, there's a default index on underbar ID. In DynamoDB, the partition key defines that default index. Uh, in document DB, we've got a query planner uh, that we can actually go ahead and query, and it kind of chooses the index. 
Uh, you know, when I was at MongoDB, I used a lot of dollar hints on my queries because I don't want that thing to use indexes that I don't spec. I want to use the index I specified. I certainly don't want to collection scan for me. When you query in DocumentDB, you're going to see two uh, 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 very relevant metrics on the result that you get back when you do an explain. It's going to be documents returned and documents scanned. If document scanned is zero, that means that, and document re returned is greater than, than zero, it means that your index covered the query, okay? Every attribute you had defined on the index was covered when you made the query. If it says documents returned and document scanned are equivalent, then it means that, well, I found the, the documents on the index, <coughs> but I had to go back to the collection to get the extended attributes. Remember, I talked about projections, right? In order to project attributes in document DB, I need to include those attributes in the index definition. That actually makes your inserts more expensive. Okay, so that's one of the nice things about a wide column database like DynamoDB with projections on the index. I don't have to, you know, those, 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 those inserts don't become more complex. They may take more WCU, but it doesn't cost more CPU to do those inserts. Uh, when we go into uh, indexing and defining indexes, uh, when I query a, a document database, I better make sure that the shard key is included as the first attribute of my index because that's what's gonna be used to determine where to route my query, and I better make sure when I make the query that I include a shard key condition, otherwise the query gets sent to every node. Now you may want that, but uh, you know, most of the time you don't, and most of those queries would be coming back empty, and that's just wasted bandwidth in the system. So you need to find compound indexes and include that shard key as the first metric, and then include the shard key values when you make the query to be able to isolate your queries to given nodes in the system. With DynamoDB, I, I choose the index, I design the index for a specific access pattern, that's the one I want to use. I will then use a partition key equality condition every time I query that GSI or every time I query that table that routes me exactly to the right storage node. I don't have to worry about making sure I do it right, it just forces you to do it right. <clears throat> Again, uh, I'm gonna optimize with compound indexes in document database. I'm gonna use projections to preload my indexes in DynamoDB. Those are the differences. There are no other differences. I'm gonna model this thing the same. I'm gonna create objects, I'm gonna index them. I'm gonna create those objects as documents, I'm gonna create those as wide column data structures, one or the other, but that's what I'm really doing with NoSQL. So anyone who tells you that there's a difference between these systems is, is, is wrong, there, there's just not. Okay, we get into complex queries, it's about understanding uh, KPIs and metrics in the system <coughs> uh, that are useful to the application, because most applications require things like top end, last end, average, counts, sums, you know, all these types of complex queries that don't really get supported in the DynamoDB API, so how do I support those queries? And we do this with change data capture processing, right? I'm gonna create a pipeline off of what we call the DynamoDB stream. The stream is a running change log of, uh, of data, of, of, of update and write operations that occur on the database. Every time you do write to the table, you're gonna see that object on the stream, and we'll be able to process that with Lambda. What do people do with it? Lots of different things. The primary thing that we're gonna do with this is we're gonna do roll-ups, right? <coughs> uh, uh, summary metrics, KPIs, uh, things that uh, you know, I kind of need in my application, right? One of the things we found at Amazon when we started to uh, work out you know, how we're gonna make these migrations and actually how to scale our relational databases, sorry, before we even determined the migrations, uh, was we offloaded the cost of these complex queries by creating you know, summary aggregation tables. And once we started doing this, it was a clue, right? We said, you know, it's too expensive to run the query to get the count, the summary, the average, the max, whatever, the min, and we're, and we're maintaining these as running aggregations. Maybe what we should do is no SQL, and that's what we do here, right? This is how you get aggregation to scale. Anyone who's using aggregation framework in MongoDB or in document database is gonna find really quickly as you scale your database that, that those queries don't scale with you. You're gonna end up remodeling your data. You're gonna implement change data capture pipelines like this to maintain those summary metrics, summary aggregations. Uh, the other thing people do is they're gonna go ahead and you know, uh, uh, sync to Elasticsearch, right? If you have indexing you know, requirements that we don't support in DynamoDB, index intersections, <laughs> uh, uh, geospatial, full text, things that DynamoDB doesn't support, let's use change data capture with streams and Lambda. Again, one of the nice things about cloud native, this is a guaranteed contract that happens with DynamoDB between the table and the Lambda process. When you use Lambda to process the stream, there's a trigger that occurs that's guaranteed at least once processing. Make sure you understand that it's at least once. Code your, your Lambda functions to be idempotent because there are rare conditions where a container failure might occur. You're in the middle of processing. Maybe I just processed the item, but I didn't update the configuration tables yet. Container refires, Lambda function picks back up right where it thinks it left off. So understand that 
these functions should be idempotent in, when you code them, uh, but there is a guaranteed contract of at least once processing. Feed that data into uh, uh, Kinesis Firehose, roll it up into S3 and Parquet files, run Athena queries on it for real-time analytics. A lot of use cases where people do exactly that. It's a wonderful solution there. Get your data off the table. It doesn't impact, and that's an asynchronous process. You don't have to worry about impacting your DynamoDB table with any of this. Uh, it's like the world's best stored procedure engine. You're not going to knock the server sideways by running a bad stored procedure. So you're just going to pay more. I'm OK with that. No, no, I'm not. A lot, a lot of my job is spent trying to get people to pay less. Trust me. And I, and I do. I'm pretty good at it. I think I'm pretty good at it. Uh, all right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, composite keys. Composite keys are an important part of data modeling. When we get into NoSQL, it's about creating sort keys that matter. In this particular example, uh, we have a, a game sessions table. Um, users have game sessions. They have different state. We're looking for sessions that are pending for a given user sorted by date. We might have an index on the sessions table. It's partitioned on the user. It's sorted on the uh, session date. And, it's, uh, and what we're doing here is we're using order by condition as the sort key condition, which is basically no sort key. And then we're using a filter condition. Filter conditions in DynamoDB apply to extended attributes, any attribute uh, that's of, of the items. You can say, you know, items that have a particular attribute value. In this case, we're saying where the status is pending. And so what happens here is that we're reading, oop, we're reading three items and we're, uh, we're returning two. I'm paying to read three. In this case, reading three is the same cost as reading two, so that filter condition is great, but if I had 10,000 items in this partition and I only wanted to read those two, that could be a pretty inefficient read, right? I'd have to get a whole bunch of items and, and pay for that and then only return two. So the way to fix that is to use composite keys. In this case, every time we insert the item, we'll take the status of the date, we'll create a new sort key called status date. Now when I query the table, I can say begins with pending and I get only the pending items, right? So we're going to use a lot of tricks like this to create selective reads out of very dense partitions, right? We're going to have a lot of items in our partitions, but the reads are very thin, so it's okay. Now, I have a lot of people say, oh, we're not supposed to put lots of items in the partitions. No, we can put all the items we want in the partitions. It's about the velocity. How fast am I writing? How fast am I reading? In DynamoDB, into a single logical partition, I can write 1,000 WCUs. That's kilobytes per second. I can read 3,000 WCUs, a w, a, a, I read 3,000 RCUs, and RCU is four kilobytes a second, so I can effectively write uh, at those rates uh, and read at those rates. Just be aware of that as we're starting to, uh, to lay the data out. Now, what we're gonna talk about next is how do we actually model complex relational data, right? And I hear this a lot, right? Where is, where, you know, how do I do this without creating normalized data models? I need lookup tables, I need, you know, all these, these constructs that we're so used to using. And, and the reality is, as I showed you, the time complexity of those queries is too high, right? We don't want to use uh, uh, those types of data models because, it, I mean, if it's, if it's that hard for a relational database to do it, how hard is it going to be for your app server, right? I mean, you know, think about it. I'm traversing the table. I'm going to be iterating result sets at the app layer. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be grossly inefficient. This is exactly what we found out at Amazon. So learn from our mistakes and start to look at how we actually model that relational data in a way that makes sense. So in this particular application, uh, we're going to be talking about employee portal. Last year, my service had delivery service had a dozen application access, a dozen access patterns. I'm going to show you one now that has 23 different access patterns uh, just to show you. And, and the other question I get a lot is how do you evolve the application, right? Isn't it hard to add new access patterns? Well, this model started with this employee table and it was that document model that we saw earlier, right? And I said, you know what, let's add different things. I added tickets, I added projects, I added you know, a whole bunch of different entities, right? I added uh, uh, <coughs> uh, that we're gonna talk about uh, when we get into looking at, at this data. Uh, 23 different access patterns. We're accessing this data on multiple dimensions uh, in multiple ways. And uh, you know, let's take a look at what some of those access patterns look like. So uh, on the table, we created many partitions, right? Many types of partitions. And then we loaded these partitions with different types of items, right? So the first partition we created uh, was a building partition. Uh, buildings have meeting reservations. Uh, they have room definitions. Uh, we have employee partitions. Employee partitions have uh, meeting objects. Right? They get invited to meetings. Uh, they have some employee metadata uh, in, 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 in associated with them. Then we have project partitions, and project partitions have time cards uh, that are submitted by employees. Employees have roles on those projects and different things that they did and whatnot, and they're submitting. Uh, projects also have project metadata. And then we have tickets. Right? Tickets have uh, you know, the, you know, the, the subject, the, the, the item that's created. When we open the ticket, they have messages that are associated with the tickets. They have owners. They have assignees. And we're going to try and access this data in multiple ways. Uh, the table's going to support nine access patterns. 
uh, the first access pattern is going to say, get me the employee metadata, uh, or get me the employee's meetings by uh, employee ID. So I'm going to query that table by employee ID. I'm going to give it a date range condition, and I'm going to give it a filter condition that says greater than zero, because you know I might have you know, items in there that end up being date ranged, and they're not meetings. But that filter condition is going to knock out anything that's not a meeting, and most employee partitions are not going to have a lot of items, so we're going to be okay with you know, filtering out those items and making that a less than selective read. Uh, the next access pattern we have is get me all the given uh, meetings for a given building to a given time range, so we can go ahead and select by building ID in our building partition, again, with a date range condition. And uh, you know, we're going to use a contains condition on an attribute that's a copy of the sort key, uh, because in Ford, I don't know why, but in DynamoDB API, you can't use contains on a sort key. So if you actually need that condition, you have to create a copy of the sort key and use contains on that as a filter condition, which is what we'll do. Uh, and that, that that copy of the sort key contains the building, the floor, or the room we're looking for <coughs> uh, to be able to su support that access pattern. Uh, next one is going to be uh, get the employee's metadata by employee ID. Every employee has a metadata item, starts with E. That's our query condition, so we query by employee ID. Uh, starts with E, gives me that access pattern. Uh, the next pattern is going to be get me the ticket history, right? So I want to get the ticket history select from the table from the ticket partition. It uh, gives me the entire ticket history uh, for a given uh, access pattern. Uh, now we're going to be getting project information, right? Select by project name with a sort key equals project name because that item that is only a selective condition inside of my partition that returns only my project metadata. I can query the project partition with the date range condition to bring back all the time cards that were filed on that particular project uh, by different employees. Uh, we can also add the filter condition by role and bring, execute the same query and say everybody who was a technical product manager on this particular uh, project in a given time range. Uh, so on and so forth. The next uh, uh, access pattern is interesting, and a lot of customers use this. We use this internally for reservation systems when we have these use cases at, at, at Amazon. Uh, oftentimes, we know some things about you know, uh, what reservations have been made, what things are available, but we don't necessarily know what things are available until we make that calculation, right? Get the things that are reservations that have been made and get the things that are available and then figure out, you know, so on, so on, so forth. So in this reservation workflow, what happens is the client comes in, the first query goes to the building, it's going to get uh, the rooms that are available in the building. As soon as I open the portal to reserve the room, I'm going to go and select a time and say, get me the rooms that are available. I'm not going to get the rooms that are available. I'm going to get the reservations on that building and floor and whatnot that they've selected during that time window. And I'm going to let the client figure out what rooms are available, because guess what? I already sent them down the room metadata. Those are both very small queries. But what ends up happening at scale, and we have several customers that have used this, they've come back and said they've actually been able to decrease the size of their application fleet, uh, server fleet, because they're not triaging that data anymore at the application server. They're just shoving it all down to the client and let the client figure it out. Right, the clients have an abundance of CPU. I'll show you another use case where it's just a version control or versioning uh, uh, workflow where we need to see versions and just send the deltas to the client instead of round tripping back to the server to get the you know, older versions. But anyways, the idea here is get the logic down to the client. Don't necessarily uh, push this logic into the application server because that's going to be expensive. Right? So the other use case there, again, to support that is we get the room metadata and then, of course, get me the, the, the uh, 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 reservations for a given building, room, whatnot. All right, so uh, next thing we're going to do is index these items. And what you're going to start to notice is these tables get smaller and smaller, because on the primary table, some of those items will only get accessed on one dimension, which is the primary access pattern that they're stored in on the table. Other items on that table need to be indexed. And this is what we're going to start to see as we start to extend this out. So this index supports an additional nine access patterns. Uh, the first access pattern that we're going to get here is get me all of the employees' meetings by email, right? One access pattern was get me, get me by employee ID. The other one's going to get me by email. So I'll index all those meeting objects on GSI-1 uh, using the email. Uh, the next is a primary use case. This is saying I log into my portal. My portal gives me everything for the last 30 days. Uh, which is all my meetings, all my time cards, all my tickets, all my messages on those tickets, everything. Uh, so I would query my employee partition by email and say, give me everything greater than 30 days ago. It brings back everything, the employee metadata, all my tickets, one query, five different access patterns solved with one single query. And this is what we're going to try and do with NoSQL databases. We're going to try to create queries that support uh, the retrieval of multiple types of objects when this is required. Group these objects into partitions on the table uh, to support these joins. Right? These are joins. This is really what this is. This is, this is, this is flat out a join. OK, uh, the next access pattern is going to be get me the employee's metadata uh, by employee ID or by uh, employee email as well. Uh, and then we're going to say, oh boy, I don't have my glasses on. 
Maybe I can read this one. <laughs> Uh, this is get the ticket history by employee email, right? So we've got all our ticket objects are going to be stored in those employee partitions using a uh, employee email as well so that we can query on that dimension. Uh, we're going to want to um, uh, then go ahead and query our projects uh, by start. Oh, this is an interesting use, use case. I had one customer that needed to have a, a start case of uh, give me everything that started within the last three months that's going to finish in the next three months, right? So it sounds like two sort conditions. And it kind of is two conditions, but you can satisfy this using a sort condition and a filter condition, right? If I query the table and say, give me everything uh, with this project name uh, <coughs> or everything across the, uh, the, the active projects in my, uh, in my company that was started three months ago with a greater than three months ago and use a filter condition that says, and target date, target delivery is less than three months from now, then really what I've done is I've done kind of a, an unselective read from the partition, gotten every project that's currently active, and the filter condition knocks out the ones that are you know, not going to deliver in the next three months. Uh, this was kind of a budgeting use case where you're like, I need to know what projects I'm going to cut. So I don't want to cut anything that's going to deliver in the next three months, but anything after that's on the table for talking about, right? I don't like those, but hey, sometimes you've got to do it, right? So, uh, <laughs> all right, next access pattern is going to be, again, CSI2. We're starting to deliver a smaller number uh, of, uh, uh, of access patterns here because uh, <coughs> we have a fewer number of objects that actually need to be indexed on these partitions, right? So the first uh, thing we're going to do here is going to be getting the tickets uh, by assignee email, right? So we had to get the ticket by uh, the uh, uh, owner email who opened the ticket. I want to get all the ticket history, and I want to get ticket history by assignee email. So every one of those ticket objects I insert, whether it's the opening of the ticket or the messages that are associated with the ticket, I'm going to add additional, decorate those objects with additional attributes so I can pick them up uh, by the owner and by the assignee. I'm going to want to get all the employees for a given manager, right? So in this particular case, again, all those employee metadata items are going to pick up another indexed uh, dimension so that I can, you know, index them by their employee's manager. I query GSI2 with the manager's ID, then I'm going to get that. When we get into the last use case here, this is the last index we're going to talk about. There's just a couple of use cases uh, on this one. Uh, we need to... Uh, you know, on this first query, we're going to get all the employees in a given city building or, or floor uh, of a building. This is that subtree aggregation uh, use case that we talked about earlier. I see this a lot. Uh, is you know people need to get all the products in a given category. Give me all the employees in a given place. You know we can, you know create a path. Just create a path of the hierarchy and use begins with on that path to get those subtree aggregations. Uh, we want to get all the tickets that are languishing. So, you know, as I know there's a lot of tickets in the organization, a lot of messages going down on those tickets, I want to get everything that hasn't been touched in the last 24 hours for escalation. Uh, so I can create a right sharded set of partitions here. You can see this ticket lives in partition seven. There might be, you know, 20 partitions here to increase the throughput depending on number of tickets my systems are processing. Uh, but again, I need 1,000 WCUs per partition. So if I'm aggregating, you know, across 10 partitions, I can write, uh, you know, 10,000, you know, tickets per second uh, would be a significant amount of workload there. But let's say the tickets might be bigger than one kilobyte. <laughs> In the end, what we end up with is a set of tables, a table that describes the access patterns that we were tasked with, uh, the query conditions that I need, the table of the GSI that I'm going to query, the filter conditions to use. And this is exactly the exercise we go through with every team I talk to. Create that entity relationship diagram. What kind of data are we working with? Define your access patterns. How am I actually accessing this data? How do I need to store this data? Okay, let's define the data model and let's come back with a set of uh, you know, clearly defined conditions that I'm going to use to produce the results that I'm looking for. And again, I built this entire model in an iterative fashion, right? I started with one or two access patterns and started adding more and more and more. Uh, you know, with real data, sometimes you might have to, you know, do an ETL on the existing table and decorate the table with the dis uh, you know, existing items with new attributes. You might need to change the values and existing attributes. But the reality is you're not going to have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? This is an evolution, and it's not dissimilar to what you go through with a relational database. It's just we're much more familiar with that. Okay, so let's get into designing for common patterns. This is about understanding what type of, uh, when to use <coughs> uh, big items. Why big items might not necessarily be the thing for you. 
Uh, in this particular use case, let's talk about a uh, customer I was talking to recently. It's insurance, insurance quoting service, fairly successful business. They're doing about 800 quotes per minute peak. Uh, they're provisioning 1,000 WCUs on their Dynamo table. The data model looks like this. Basically, consumers come in, they open up uh, an insurance quote, they create a new quote. Uh, they're gonna start creating versions of that quote by changing things, you know, oh, no, I drive more than that, or you know, I'm, I live here. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to be doing this here, whatnot. Uh, basically, they'll cre every customer might change the quote two or three times. Every time they change the quote, they would create a new copy of the quote with a new version. So they had a customer ID as the partition key. Their sort key was along the lines of quote ID under bar version. When a customer would say, OK, show me version, my current version, they would just you know, scan forward index false, limit one, they would get the most current version. Uh, as customers started going back and paginating through these versions, they would look at and go back to the database and get a new version, right? So it was great for them, they loved it. They came to me, started asking me about optimizations. Is there anything we can do here? I said, well, sure. Uh, the first thing we can look at is how much data changes when I update a quote. Does a lot of data change? Does a little data change? Uh, it turns out that really only a couple attributes change. As a matter of fact, 90% of the quote is immutable data. Right, it's like address, I mean, it's not immutable, but it never changes, right? Uh, address, name, you know, phone numbers, things like that. Uh, and every time they were creating a version of the quote, they were writing all that data back to the database and creating a 50 kilobyte, you know, update. So what we did was said, look, okay, why don't you store the deltas on the table inside the partition, change your schema slightly. Now what you've got is a quote ID and uh, all those version attributes, those are just versions of the various sections of your quote. And we're going to, when you query the quote, you're going to send down all these version objects, and you can push the logic to assemble the most current view into the endpoint, right, at the, at, at the, on the browser. And so now they drop their provision capacity on the table from 1,000 to 50 WCUs, okay? Because most of the time, they're not creating big blobs. I mean, every now and then, they create a new quote, but most of their traffic was just updates to existing quotes. And if they ever go above 50 WCUs, that's OK, because they'll just go ahead and use the burst bucket to satisfy if they get four or five simultaneous quotes being created, they have no problems. They see spikes regularly over their provision WCU. They're fine with that. So this is a really good uh, uh, example of how I can uh, optimize the data model by thinking about how I'm implementing the system and how it affects the entire stack. Right, we have a lot of customers that do things like this that come back and say, you know, I was able to decrease my application server fleet by 5% because I'm no longer doing, I'm not handling that data in the application server anymore. I'm just passing it off to the front end and letting them uh, do that triage. As a matter of fact, in this system, imagine they don't even have to come back to the server to get the previous versions. If the customer gets a, the current version says back, 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 there's not one request going back to the front end, uh, to the API of their service. All right, it's all sitting there on the front end and they know what it is. Okay. Uh, one of the things I gotta say before we stop, no SQL workbench for DynamoDB. I don't know how many folks are aware of this. We released this tool a couple months ago. This is the best tool out there for modeling no SQL databases today. It will build the types of views I show you in my presentations, these aggregate views of the table. You can, what's nice about this is you can create just some JSON data, define the JSON data, throw it into the, into the modeler, and then you can start defining indexes on your various attributes, and it'll actually show you how the data, your sample data lays out. It also has load from a, a relational database. You can connect to a relational database. It has a code generator. You can use the code generator to uh, you know, help uh, build your own applications. It's, uh, it's rock solid stuff. Uh, there's a nice, uh, easy to read URL there, but uh, I, I couldn't find anything easier, so that's what you got. Uh, but with those charts will be online, and if you Google for NoSQL Workbench for DynamoDB, you'll find it easily enough. It's really a great tool. I got more and more customers coming to me with their models already done, and it makes it nice, because I can just load it in, and we can make our tweaks and show them exactly what uh, needs to happen. Uh, all right, conclusions. <clears throat> NoSQL is not about non-relational data. Please don't use that term. If you notice, I didn't use that term very often other than to say it doesn't exist because it doesn't exist. It's a marketing term that was invented by marketing people who try to describe technology they don't understand to other people who don't understand it, and they came up with this. It's not relational. It must be non-relational. Don't use that. Don't fall in that trap. Data is all relational, or it doesn't matter. Uh, the ERD still matters. Yeah, a relational database is not deprecated by NoSQL. Uh, you know, use NoSQL for OLTP. Uh, or, or decision support systems at scale. Uh, use that relational database for OLAF, uh, but I'd always think cloud native first. I'll tell you, the elasticity uh, of, the, of the AWS compute cloud is amazing, uh, and of, of cloud native services like DynamoDB is, is unparalleled uh, in scale. So I, I would go there first. 
Uh, all right, we got a lot of tools for you guys to look at when you want to learn more about uh, uh, AWS database services. Uh, go here, AWS training and certification, uh, lots of uh, online resources, digital training courses. Uh, we've got some real good stuff coming out from our partners as well. Linux Academy, I think, just released a new DynamoDB uh, training uh, uh, modeling course and definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, but there's some tools out there for you like there's never been. There's a lot of information for you to kind of master this stuff and hopefully you got some good information from me today. So thank you very much for your time. So, oh, by the way, if you didn't like the session, then it's DAT 450. If you like it, it's 403. Please rate me. <laughs>